morning. All right. Well, um, as he was saying, my name is Dennis Schreiner. I'm from Bozeman, Montana, and it was we actually had the coldest day on record this year. I'm sure it's like this area as well. It was 39 below. Anybody ever been in that? Amen. But uh, praise God, I was in Hawaii during that time, so <laughs> so not my wife was home. But praise God, um, I, I tried not to tell her I was having a great time in Hawaii at that point. Amen. Praise the Lord, but I have a beautiful wife named Tammy, who pastors a church that we started back in 1999, and I've been traveling probably as a revivalist for about uh, 12 years now, and um, I do about 160 meetings a year on the road. Uh, I did 18 days here just in a row, went home for one day, and now um, I think I was over, I, was where I flew in from Dallas this morning uh, just to be with you this morning, and I was in San Francisco on uh, on Friday night, so I've been on seven flights just since Friday, amen, and I'm ready to go, amen, all right, praise the Lord, I feel invigorated because the Spirit of God is here, amen, uh, so my wife pastors the church we started, in, it's called LOFT, which is an acronym for um, living on fire together, amen, and then I have four daughters, so I usually ask everybody to pray for me, a lot of a lot of people think I come to pray for them, but I really just come to be prayed for. Amen? Because um, I'm the only man in the house, but um, I'm obviously, uh, I, I'm really blessed and spoiled rotten. And so my oldest is uh, 21 here in August. She's going to be a senior in college this year. I got one that's going to be a senior in high school. Uh, and then I've got one that's 15. She just started driving, so your prayers need to go up more even now at this point, right? Um, she's got her permit, and then I have one that's going to be 12 here in September. Amen? Amen. And, and so, anyway, I'm just trying to get you to know a little bit about who I am, since you don't know who these weird guys are that come in, you know, when they're guest speakers and things. So, and and then um, we have a, a couple other ministries. One is Revival Cry, which is what you see when myself and some others that we've trained up come in and do meetings and, and stir up people uh, to be ministers of the gospel themselves to see uh, things that are dead come to life in our culture. Amen. And then uh, we have an apostolic network, which is called Art Network, which is a network of ministers and ministries um, all over the nation, as well as um, some other nations as well. And last of all, one of my hearts and my brother was talking about kids, because I usually don't do youth ministry, honestly. I haven't done that in a long time anymore, but I do have a heart for kids, because I've got youth at home. Amen. But um, um, it's to rescue children at risk and young girls out of the sex slave trafficking industry. And so I've been doing that since about 2002. Um, and so um, one of the projects that I'm really excited about right now is a project that we're doing in Cebu in the Philippines. And we bought a piece of property over there for about $400,000. And we built a couple structures um, on that land. We have rescued over 100 girls right now, presently. Amen. Praise God. And, we actually, and we actually have room to rescue 100 more girls. Amen. And um, what they do there is they actually take these girls and they put them in cages, like kennels. And they, they stack them up in back alleys. And men come from all over the world. And they buy these girls for $1,000. So what we do is we work with a ministry that's over there that helps us go in incognito, under the radar. And, and we buy these girls back for $1,000. Amen? So, you know, uh, this is something that's really our heart uh, to do and, and things. If you're interested in something like that, you can go to the table and you can, you can help give toward that and help buy a girl back if you'd like to do that. Um, that would be awesome. I Actually, this week alone, just this weekend, um, we've had $7,000 come in toward just girls, just rescuing girls, even just this weekend, so we get to rescue seven more girls. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, you know, I don't know if you know this, but in the United States right now, we're number one for sex trafficking. I don't know if you know that, but like, it, I don't know if we knew that before, or our statistics were just wrong, but like, yeah. It's it's a big deal right now. We need to be rescuing kids everywhere, amen. And so that you know we get to help them be future leaders um, for America. Um, but Jesus said this, um, and this will just help me launch into what I want to speak about here. But so Lord, we just ask you right now, Lord, um, to just uh, speak to us. That you open up our ears to hear and our eyes to see. That you stir us, Lord God, for a greater hunger, Lord God. That you would take us out of the place, Lord God, where 
um, maybe we feel like there, there are obstacles and there are delays, Lord God, and you would begin to do what we cannot do for ourselves. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And we all said, Amen. Amen. But Jesus said this, he said, he said, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And sometimes people don't realize what that word means when it says to pray. I found that a lot of people that go to church oftentimes, you know, they think that they're praying to get God to do stuff. And, and I believe that God is not trying to, that, that, that we're not praying to get God to do stuff. Like, we're not just waiting on God, but God is waiting on us. Amen? Like, because the word pray, it actually means this. It, it means that, one, that God would change your heart. That you, he would change your heart with his heart. Amen? That you would get revelation of his heart. He'd reveal that which is of him to you so that you can begin to uh, function according to that heart. Your heart would be changed. Amen? But the second part of that, the second part of that is that you would become a solution for the things he changed your heart for. Amen? So like how will Fontana change? Will Fontana change because you pray for God to change it? Or will, or, or will Fontana change because something happens in you that will change it? So will it be God or will it be you? It's yes. It's both. It's God in you. Amen? And, and, and so, but we, we, we have to recognize that it's not something that's just this, this thing that happens away from us. The reason why I say that is because as much as I believe in all the spiritual stuff, like I prophesy over people all the time. I don't get, feel any better about myself because I do that. I just believe that it's normal Christianity to hear from God, and it's normal Christianity to speak on God's behalf. Uh, and, and so God is not just a God that's spiritual, but he's a God that's practical. And so, like, when he's saying about bringing the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven to earth, he's talking about how do I take my reality, those things that are of the spiritual realm, and how do I bring them into the earth where they would be practical? Amen? Like, how many know that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me? The word truth there is not just speaking about the Bible in terms of Scripture. I'm all for that. But it's speaking about something more. The word truth actually means verity, which is the word that is translated as reality. Jesus, when he was saying that he was truth, he was saying, I am another reality. I am from another reality. You see, the good news of the gospel wasn't that you get to settle for the reality that you live in. The good news of the gospel is that God gave a way to bring His reality into your reality and change your circumstances, to change your reality, to change the reality of your family, to change the reality of your community with His reality. Amen? I mean, that, 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 that's a God that wants to, He cares about the everyday stuff as well. Amen? I mean, I love healing. And that's why we do this thing where we're rescuing girls. Why? Because as much as we want to do the prophetic, and as much as we want to see people healed, and as much as we want to pray, and as much as we want to do those things, we also want it to be practical in the sense of how does it touch people's lives that they would know the love of God. Amen? Amen. But I can tell you, like right now, I'm hungrier for God than I've ever been. I got radically saved when I was 17 years old. I grew up in a home where my uh, mother was a, an atheist and my brother was involved in a satanic cult. Um, we didn't go to church. We didn't believe in God. And, and when, I, when I got saved, you know, I was on fire for the Lord. I thought all Christians, they went on the street and witnessed to people. That's what they told me they did, so I did it. And, and so I just thought everybody shared their faith. I thought everybody read their Bible. I read the Bible because I just wanted to know what the Bible said. I thought everybody else knew more than I did. I thought, I, I, I mean, I, I didn't think it. I was, I was ignorant. I didn't know what the Scripture said. So I didn't want people like, like telling me things and not knowing whether it was of God or not. Amen? And so I was, I was excited about God. But to be honest with you, like to my shame, I would tell you that there are times where I went through the motion in my own relationship with God. And, and, and I wasn't on fire for God the way that I need to be because, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen in life with people and sometimes even church people that can get you to want to settle for less than God, less than what God really has for you. But, you know, you know, there's something that God wants to do. And so I decided finally, though, at one point in my life, 
that I was not going to do anything ministry anymore if God, like, did not speak to me. And so I had this encounter. God actually helped me because the only time I ever prayed to God was really when I was going to go out and witness to people and I wanted to see somebody come to Jesus or because I had to minister in some capacity. But I never prayed really because I, because I liked God. Like, like I like to pray. I didn't really like to pray. I know, sometimes we, I think we don't, we don't really want to say that out loud because it doesn't sound right, right? It doesn't sound I can't say that I don't like to pray. But I didn't really like to pray. Like I could actually say, you know what, I knew that God loved me, but I don't know if I thought he liked me. You know, I mean, you ever feel that way? Like I know that God loved me, otherwise he wouldn't have saved me. But does he really like who I am? And more than that, and this can sound blasphemous to people, but I think you'll understand what I'm saying here. I knew that I loved God, but I don't know if I knew I liked Him. And you know, there's a reason for that. Like, how would I know if I liked Him if I never hung out with Him? How would you know if you liked somebody if you never spent any time with Him? I loved Him because I knew He saved me from my sins, but I didn't know that I liked Him. I actually didn't know, you know, I've read about joy. But I didn't know that he was joy. I didn't know that he was fun. I didn't know he wanted to be my friend. I didn't know he wanted to speak to me and he wanted to talk to me. So here I'm in this place where I've done ministry for some time and I'm having a level of success in it, but I'm doing it all in my own strength and my own effort. And so I finally decided, you know, this is not going to go well for me. As I get older, it seems to be a lot more work. It's stressful. I'm getting tired all the time. And I say, you know what? I don't want to live my life that way. I don't believe that God wants me to live my life that way. So I finally decided, okay, I'm just going to seek the Lord. And the Lord gave me the strength to do it somehow as a supernatural thing. And I laid on the floor of my church for literally 30 hours a week for three straight months. Now, as I'm laying in the presence of God, um, God doesn't say anything to me. I've spent 100 hours with God approximately plus, which I thought was a sizable investment of my time. And so after about, after about three and a half weeks of doing this, I'm, I'm in the presence of God, and God hasn't said one thing to me. Now, all my friends are saying things like, you know, well, God's speaking to me about this, and God's speaking to me about that, and God said this, and God said that. And I'm like, God's not saying anything to me. So I'm three and a half weeks into this, and I'm finally, I am ticked off. I'm mad. I'm mad at God. I, I am mad because he hasn't spoken one thing to me, but he's speaking to everybody else. And so I am a tantrum before God, literally. I'm like, God, I don't get it. You're talking to everybody else, but you're not talking to me. What is going on, you know? What's the problem with the, that you have with me? You know, and I'm just kind of bawling God out, and... And, you know, in the middle of all that, God's not bothered with my tantrum. He's not impressed. He, he's, not, he's not worried. He doesn't respond. So I kind of like a little baby having a tantrum. I just wear myself out, and I just lay there on the floor again. And I'm laying there, and, and I, it literally is like about three or four days later, and the Holy Spirit finally spoke to me. And the first thing he said to me is, are you here to be with me? Or are you here to see what... I can do for you. I mean, the Holy Spirit just has a way of getting to the point. That wasn't exactly what I was looking to hear, right? I was, I was looking to hear, you know, I want to do some signs and wonders and miracles and give you some words of knowledge for healing and this and that. But instead, God was just really more interested about like, like, do I want to, do I really want him? Do you know that God doesn't need you? And I know that sounds terrible to say. So, I mean, it can sound that way. But, but what I, the next thing I'm going to tell you is more positive. He wants you. It's better to be wanted than it is to be needed. Do you know that? Yep. Like if I go home and I tell my wife, well, I need you. I really need you to help me out here a little bit, you know, because like, I can't do all this on my own and stuff. You know, my wife might feel like there's some value in that, you know, to work together as a team. But she likes it a lot better when I want her more than I just need her. Amen? Amen. And there's something there. I'm just telling you, like, there's something going on right now. I don't know if you know this. You know, maybe you're feeling and sensing this here. But, like, all around the country right now, there is a group of people that are raising up right now that are hungry for God and are thirsty for God. It may not look like it in terms of the normal, traditional thing that you're seeing going on. 
But there is a remnant of God. I don't even like to use that word, to be honest with you. Because the word remnant is overused, really. Everybody thinks they're a part of the remnant. The word remnant means a small part, right? It doesn't just mean like everybody. But in Isaiah 11, 11, the Bible says that God is raising up a remnant a second time. And that doesn't just mean that God did it one time, and then he did it a second time. It means that God raises up a group of people to release what it is that God is doing in every generation. Now that's encouraging. That means that no matter what it looks like, or how bad things might look, or how thing, bad things might be going on in your life, that God has promised that he will raise up a group of people in every generation to cause there to be another move of God. And so there's something that's stirring right now. All of the United States, there's this remnant group of people. They're hungry to pray. My wife asked me at the beginning of the year, she says, she says, are you seeing something different this year? She goes, because this year I can't get people to stop worshiping. They want to keep going. They don't want to stop praying. They're asking if we can just keep going. There's something that's being served. And there's a radical group of people right now. They're becoming evangelistic again. They're sharing their faith again. A group of people that just want to be, they don't care how big the church is or how small the church is. What they want is a group of people that want to pray they want to worship. They want to go after the presence of God. They want people that will encourage them in what God has called and put in their heart to do. And they want to go out and they want to win people for Jesus. And it's happening again. And it's stirring up everywhere right now. You know, almost everywhere I've been this year, I would say that 90% of the places I've been, people are on their knees crying out to God, wanting more of God. You know, there's always exceptions, you know, because we don't have to respond to it. But it's something that God is doing. That is something that, that it, it starts to happen so much that you recognize that something different is happening. You know, like, then I think about a guy like Moses. Man, Moses, he kind of impresses me. In Exodus 33, 20, um, God says this. He said, he says to Moses, he says, he says, if any man sees my face, he will die. And then they go over to the next chapter, and God says, seek my face. <laughs> You're like, God, this seems like a setup, right? But, but, you know, religiously, a lot of people have misinterpreted that scripture over the year to mean that God is going to kill you if you were to ever see God. You hear people say it all the time, if you see me. You won't live. You'll, God, you'll die. Nobody's seen the face of God. But that verse, it actually means this. It means, if, in the Hebrew, it means, if any man sees me. In other words, when he, when he uses that word see, he said, have a revelation of me. What it means is, you will not be able to live like you did before. You can't stand saved. <laughs> like, you know what that tells me a little bit? If you're... If you're playing religion, so that's what I was talking about. Sometimes you go through the motions. We've all been there before. That's why I shared it with you. I'm not, I'm not trying to condemn. I'm saying we've all done that at times. But I don't want to stay there. Like my mom, I was a terrible student when I was a kid. And my mom used to say things like, if you're going to go to school, you might as well get something out of it. I mean, if you're going to be in the presence of God, you might as well get something out of it. And then you might, you might as well go ahead and connect with God. You might as well go ahead and try to hear from God. You might as well get hungry about God. Why just go to go through the motions? I mean, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, so I don't understand like why I would just go to church. I'm not saying that we shouldn't go to church, but I mean, I understand like wanting God. Go to go because I want to connect with God, but I don't understand just going and not and, and just sitting there going, "Oh man, when's this going to get over?" Because that's a focus issue, really. It's a heart issue about what's going on, right? Yep. So what that tells me, see, religion wants you to have an experience but not have to change. It wants you to feel like you've been through something but nothing really happened inside of you. See, but God wants to have an encounter with you that will cause you to be changed. How do you know? Because... The Bible says if you saw God, if you had a revelation of God, 
it would cause you to be changed every time you came into his presence every time you got a revelation of who he is see you know like now right now in the western world church as a whole we think that if we have some kind of intellectual understanding of God somehow, that somehow that means it's revelation. That's not really what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches if you've got a revelation of God, you don't just have some mental thing to teach somebody. It's caused your whole life to change. Amen. It's caused, and I'm, I'm going to get to that a little bit more in just a second too, amen? Because I'm going to prove it to you. Because right now, a lot of times, we think we got revelation because we heard some teaching, and then we repeat the teaching, and we think that that's revelation. But that's not really what the Bible actually teaches us. See? That Moses, look, look at Moses. Here he is as a religious leader, if you will. I hate that word, but he's the religious leader of Israel at that point, right? And, and Moses has had, like, a burning bush experience. You know, that's kind of a sign or a wonder. I mean, it would be significant, right? But then he has this other notable miracle. The parting of the Red Sea. I know, and it kind of seems like a big deal. I don't know about you, I've never parted the Red Sea. <laughs> Maybe one of you have, I don't know. But like, it's kind of a big deal, right? So Moses has had these kinds of encounters with God. And yet Moses still is in the passage of Exodus 33, they're going, show me your glory. <laughs> See, this is what, I, in ministry, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of people have big egos. <laughs> no, I know that's hard to believe. I know that's not true of your pastor. He's a good guy, amen? So, so, so we got to get him off the hook right away, right? But, but there are a lot of guys that have a lot of big egos, and... And instead of being desperate for God, they kind of have this posture like, mm -hmm. I got it all together. Yeah, if you need some help, you know, I've been there, done that, you know, I'd be willing to give you a couple pointers to help you out. But they're not willing to be undignified. They're not willing to be desperate for God. But see, here's what Moses knows. Moses knows it doesn't matter what miracle he had yesterday. If he doesn't have an encounter with God, where God reveals himself and God speaks, he's got nothing. Amen. Do you know that the reality is there's not one of us in this room, we don't got nothing unless God speaks to us again. We got nothing. It doesn't matter. Like, I, I've seen so many miracles. I've seen over 500 people healed. I've seen crippled people healed. I've seen dead, uh, dead people be raised. I, I, I've seen blind people see. I've seen all this, like just two weeks ago in York, Pennsylvania, we had another woman uh, that was legally blind, that her eyes were open so she could see. She began to be able to read the stuff that was on the wall. But here's what I'm saying. That's not that impressive. What's impressive is like, where are you with God? Because, because none of that, all of that is yesterday unless God speaks to you today. Amen. You need an encounter. So Moses is saying that. Show me your glory. That's what he said. What's that mean? Give me a revelation. Reveal yourself to me. I need you to show yourself to me. Because if you don't show yourself to me, I've got nothing. We need that kind of revelation today. It's not just head knowledge. It's not just religion. It's not just reading their Bible. I mean, the scriptures themselves, the Bible says, you know, Jesus said, you search the scriptures, but you don't know me. That means there was something deeper. The scriptures were supposed to actually bring you into a relationship where you actually had a relationship with God that speaks. The God that wants to have a relationship with you. There's no way that you can read the Bible from beginning to end and find out that the whole Bible is about having a relationship with a God that's personal and a God that wants to reveal himself to you. He's a good God. Yeah. And then Moses, see, he knows this because he says this. He says, don't send me from this place unless you show me your glory. He says, because how will all the other people of the earth know who you are? I wonder if we're not seeing a lot of people coming to Jesus because we don't really kind of have that heart. We're willing to go and share our knowledge sometimes if we don't feel afraid. 
here's the thing I know. I, I, I know this, and I know this can even sound hard to people. If you're afraid to share your faith, it's probably an indicator that you haven't spent time with God. Hmm. The scriptures teach that perfect love casts out fear. I know because I've had fear. We've all had fear. It's not normal for me to feel fear, but when I have fear, it usually means that I need to go get with God. To see, like, I know this. And, and the reality is, if you haven't been with God, you should be fearful to share your faith. That would be normal. But if you've been with God, and you have a revelation of God, it will cause your eyes to get off of people, and it will cause your eyes to get off of what they think about you, and your eyes will get onto Him, and you'll be more worried about what He's saying that you'll forget about your lack of confidence in your own insecurity. You know insecurity is sin? Because then insecurity is you magnifying you. We're supposed to be magnifying God. I mean, the foundation of the gospel is that you were crucified on the cross with Christ Jesus. It wasn't just Jesus that died, you died with him. Paul says it's no longer um, he that lives, but it's Christ that lives in him. See, if you're a born again Christian, the only way that you can be born again is because you chose to die. And then, you know, today we have all these Christians that, oh, and they have all these issues. Well, dead people don't have issues. <laughs> you might have some obstacles that you have to overcome in Christ, but you're not supposed to have issues. You die. It's the only way you can be born again. You can't be born again if it's just, if, you're, if it's you that's living. And, if, and then people, people say things like this, well, how can, how can God use me? Little old me, who am I? Well, then you don't understand the gospel, which means you haven't been with God. You need a revelation of who you are. You need God to show you who you are. Because if you're dead and it's Jesus that is alive, then what your testimony is, is that God can't use me even though I'm dead and it's Jesus? God can't use Jesus now? Well, what are we worshiping? We're worshiping Jesus because we say that we believe that he's God and he's bigger than all. But we don't believe that he's big enough to use us. That's the one exception. Is he, he can use anybody, but he just can't use me. He can use a donkey, but he just can't use me. Tonight, maybe I'll share my testimony and stuff like that a little bit more. Even with the young people and stuff like that. But I'll, I'll tell you, I'm living proof that God is desperate for men. If I can do this stuff, God, anybody can do this stuff, amen? amen. I guarantee you, he can use you, amen? amen. amen. Look at like, uh, you know, Matthew chapter 6. It's an interesting verse to me. It says, it says, you know, verse 21 says, where your heart is, your treasure will be also. Which is speaking about which reality is your heart going to be connected to? I might come back to that. Hold that thought in your mind. But think about like Isaiah. Isaiah says this, that there's a day that's coming that the whole earth, that there'll be an understanding that the whole earth is full of the glory of God. That challenges me, you know that? Because you know what that means? One, it means the whole earth is full of the glory of God. Everywhere you go, the glory of God is there. It's not just in a church meeting. It's not just when the worship team is playing. Although I love to be able to have an atmosphere to worship together. I love all of that. But the, the limitation sometimes in our mind is to think that it's only in the atmosphere. Do you know that Smith Wigglesworth, you know, guys that we look at as heroes in the faith that were doing major miracles and having major revivals, do you know what he said? It's a lot different than what you hear ministers or even people say as Christians today. Because a lot of people are just like, well, I'm just well, let's just see, you know, you know, maybe God will speak to me and maybe I'll feel like I'll be moved or motivated to do that. Well, this is what Smith Wigglesworth would say. When God's not moving, I get him moving. That was something that a revelation of the authority of God that was inside of him to release it. Do you know that most people, if you were to look at the healing movement, even back in the 50s, a majority of those people were on their deathbed, ready to die of a terminal illness. They read the scriptures and they did not get healed. 
And then what happened is when one, all of a sudden they were reading over and over and over again. And the Holy Spirit would begin to give them revelation. And the Holy Spirit would begin to illuminate what, what that really meant. God himself would speak to them. Which is what, what, what faith is actually built on. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Which is the rhema word meaning Jesus himself or God himself spoke to you. And all of a sudden they would get healed. And now they have the authority to begin to release it for others to be healed as well. If the whole earth is full of the glory of God, I mean, why don't I notice it? See, I think part of the reason a prayer was to become more sensitive to the things of the Spirit rather than just becoming sensitive to the things of the flesh. But then, you know, in Isaiah, it says, this, in Isaiah 60, it says this, it says, it says, that God would come upon you. And it says, and the glory of God would be seen on you. It doesn't say that you'll just share the scripture with people in terms of lost people. It doesn't, it doesn't say that you'll just say you went to church. It says that there is something about having an encounter with God that will actually cause God to come on you. I know he's in you, but he will come on you and people will be able to see it tangibly. Here, here's what I know that I know that I know. I don't know anybody that God is using in any significant way that has not spent time with God. And this is saying that there is a residue that is upon people that have been with God that is not explainable, but that people will see it on you. And the Bible says that this is the answer to nations changing. See, I think, I think, I think that today from my travels and stuff, I'd say in a lot of the church today, I think we think there's a shortcut. I don't know if we'd say it, but I think, I think, I think we think there's a shortcut. We can mark it. We can just build that somehow we'll have revival, but we don't really have to get with God. I, I personally believe this. I personally believe that God made it impossible for you, at least on a regular basis, because there's always exceptions, because God is a God of mystery as well. But as a whole, he made it impossible for you to be able to walk out the things that you're supposed to be able to walk out in terms of what he called you to do without actually having a relationship with him. He made it impossible. And when I say relationship, I'm not just saying like you're born again and you're making it to heaven. I'm talking about that you're actually learning to hear from God, that you like to be with him. There's that verse in the scriptures that says this. It says, God shows mysteries to his friends. It's one of my favorite verses, you know, like because yeah, this is what I kind of found out. If you're hanging out with God, because after that encounter with God, you know what he does? He just starts to drop stuff on you. If you just be his friend. I mean, think about it. If you, we were created in the image of God. When you hang out with your friends, they sometimes will just reveal stuff about themselves. There'll, there'll be a trust that's built and, the, and, and they'll all of a sudden share stuff that's vulnerable or share parts of their life that they didn't know with you. Well, God's like, he's like that. He, when he's hanging out with you, instead of like when you just want the answer. And sometimes, sometimes it's like God's not looking just to get the answer because then you just run away and say, oh, I don't really want to be with you. <laughs> but what God's doing is he like, when you just want to hang out with him, all of a sudden it's like, he starts sharing stuff with you. Out of nowhere. You, you think you're going nowhere, and all of a sudden God's like, he, he shares some revelation for you. All of a sudden it's like, it's something that could change everything in your life. The major <clears throat> obstacle, or the major thing that you don't know how to have a breakthrough in, the, the delay in your life. Or it could be a strategy maybe for some kind of a ministry or something that God wants to do. All of a sudden, it becomes clear because God speaks out of nowhere because he shows mysteries to his friends. Isaiah 60, that's what it's talking about. Arise and shine. Do you know that, do you know the Bible is saying that this is going to happen? It's not saying it's going to happen when things are good. It's actually saying that it's going to happen when things are bad. Because it actually says in the midst of dense darkness... I mean, we, we got to have some people start to know who they are. 
we got to have a revelation of our identity to know who we are. Mm. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised by all this, right? The Bible, Jesus said, Jesus said, you know, that where the light is, that the darkness can be no more. Right. In that passage of Scripture, the word light is actually the word for order. The word for darkness is the word for chaos, meaning that you were born for this. You were born to bring order into chaos. <coughs> but think about it. So the Bible says, wherever your heart is, in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 6, says, wherever your heart is, he says, that's where your treasure will be also. And the next part of the verse says this, it says, following, it says, it says, the eye is the lamp of the body. What's that mean? He said, he's using it as a metaphor. He's saying the eye is the place in which you see or that you have revelation. If you study it throughout the old covenant, you'll find, you know, he gives Abijam a, a light because of David who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to 2 Corinthians 15. Or 2 Kings 15, not 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry. What? That he was going to give him revelation to bless a city and to bless a nation even though the nation didn't deserve to be blessed because he was evil, but because of what somebody else did. David, who was like a foreshadow of Christ for us, it was prophetic. But, but when the Bible says, the eye is the lamp of the body, it's now making what was corporate now personal. And it's now saying that that is the place in which you receive the revelation. Now look what the Bible says. It says that the eye is sound. What does that mean? It means, is, is, is the eye healthy? How is the eye healthy? When you see from God's perspective, rather than just seeing from your perspective. You know one of my pet peeves today? Is, is ministers that run around and say, just decree and declare things. Here, here's the problem. If you declare and decree things, but you haven't heard from God, you don't have any authority. Your authority wasn't based on your positive confession. Your authority was based on the revelation of God. I can prove that to you over and over again in Scripture. Jesus, for instance, he never did anything except for that which he saw the Father doing. He never spoke anything except for that which, the, which, which he heard the Father speaking. Then you go to Matthew 16, and what does it say there? It says, Jesus asked them, he says, well, who do men say that I am? And they say, well, some say this prophet, and some say that prophet. And Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, well, you are the Son of the living God. You are Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says what? This is... This has been revealed to you by my Father which is in heaven. And then he goes on and he says, he, he says, on this rock I will build my church. Now when Jesus is talking about the church there, he's not talking about like this kind of a gathering. What he's talking about is what he calls ecclesia, called out ones, which means your identity is to be called out. You were just, we gather together to go to school so that we can be equipped so that we can fulfill our calling to be called out ones. You recognize this is not your calling. This is preparation for your calling. Because you're supposed to make an influence wherever it is you go. So you can actually look at that and say that Jesus is talking about you being the church. And what does he say about that? He says, he says, on this rock, what rock? That rock which was revealed by my Father in heaven. I'm going to build it on that. I'm going to build your life on that which is revealed by my Father in heaven. And he says what? The gates of hell will not prevail against you. Well, what does that mean if you're not ever hearing from God? It means the gates of hell could prevail against you. Here's what I'm tired of. of. I'm, ti I'm tired of watching people have the gates of hell prevail against them. Amen. It's not fun to watch that. I know as a pastor, I, I pastored before. Sometimes you try to help people, and people just keep going through the same stuff. They want you to be the answer. They don't ever really want to connect with God. But the pastor, and there's no minister. They can't be all your answer. They can direct you. They can direct you back to have a relationship with God where God would speak and he would change your heart, and he would cause your life to begin to move. But you've got to hear from God for yourself. Amen? See, and if you didn't, and if you didn't believe that, look at the next part. Jesus says this. He says, he says, 
Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Do you, do you, that makes no sense. I'm setting you up here a little bit. I mean, why would Jesus pray, say, pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? In other words, he's talking about trying to get earth to look like heaven. But now all of a sudden he switched it up on us and we're supposed to be trying to get heaven to look like earth? Mm -mm. No. The verse actually means this. In the original language it actually means whatever you see bound in heaven, you can bind on earth. Whatever you see loosed in heaven, you can loose on earth. In other words, your authority is not based on just your positive thinking, but I'm also not trying to suggest to you that you should be negative on purpose. Amen? <laughs> Nobody wants to be around that either. I just said if you want to have authority. So if you're decreeing and declaring things, if it's just an intellectual decree and declare, then you're living in deception. And most of the churches live in a deception today because they're declaring and decreeing things, but they're actually not seeing anything change. The gospel is supposed to be a fruitful gospel. And it comes from it comes from, from heaven, amen. But here's what the Bible says: the eye is the lamp of the body. And it says that the eye is sound. Look what the next part says. The whole body will be full of light. In other words, you can't say that you've got some intellectual understanding of the gospel and say that's revelation if your whole body is still in a place of darkness. You can't just have head knowledge without it not actually setting you free. So that means that if, if you thought you had a revelation, you've been set free, set free from, from trauma, that means your body's not carrying trauma. If you have revelation that you've been set free from being a victim, then you're still not running around as a victim. If you get revelation, see, the, the, Jesus, he, he delivers us from our own deception. We can't deceive ourselves by thinking that we got head knowledge, but it's actually not making an impact. The revelation actually causes our whole body to be set free. So that now, see, here, here's one of, my, one of my questions. If the whole earth is full of the glory of God, and the glory of God is everywhere. And our eye is supposed to be the lamp of the body. And we're supposed to live out of this place of having a sound eye that causes our whole body to be full of light. Then why does it seem like all we can recognize is the darkness? If you're supposed to be a solution, or, let me, think about the worst place that you can think about. Whatever, the most sinful place, like maybe it's that place in Cebu that I talked about with those girls in those cages in the alley. Or, or sometimes I think about like a dark alley where maybe there's a drug dealer that's shooting up heroin next to a trash can. Got a couple prostitutes on both sides of the alley. Maybe a couple drug dealers also hanging out in the alley. And you know, it'd be a little scary to walk down that dark alley because you're afraid somebody might jump out and stab you or try to rob you or whatever would happen. The Bible says the, the glory of God is there. What good is it if, if we as believers only notice that it's bad and that it's wrong? I, I'm not saying there shouldn't be an awareness of that. I think any unbeliever is aware of that. What I'm saying is we're supposed to be full of light. Then we are the light. And that means we should be able to discern the light, not just the darkness. Like if that guy in, that I just pictured... Like, like in my story, it, it's sitting next to a trash can, he's shooting up heroin, and all you notice is like, well, that's really bad. You shouldn't do that. That's not gonna, that's gonna hurt your life. That's gonna destroy your life. How how will that help him? Who's gonna who's gonna see the light? Who's gonna see the solution? Who's gonna be the solution? Who's going to see that the glory of God is there and operate out of the glory of God rather than just operate out of the darkness? Because what does Jesus say in the next part of that? He says that the eye is not sound. The eye is not healthy. It says the whole body will be full of darkness. In other words, like what we have revelation of or what we lack revelation of is the thing that we discern out of. Am I making some sense here? Get a little quiet. Got the deer in the headlight. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm just not, I only know how to be mean, amen. amen. Praise the Lord God. God is good. See, we need people that are, we need people. See, I think we bought into a bill of goods today that we think if we market better, we make our image better, we do all of this stuff that somehow we'll see a move of God. But I'm inspired by some of the stories of guys that went before us, you know. There's a guy named uh, Father Nash. I don't know if some of you guys know who he is. Um, he, was, he was called the prevailing prince of prayer. Anybody know who he is? He, he lived in upper state New York, pastor knows. And, and he lived in upper state New York. And, and most people consider him to be a failure. There's only a small article written about this guy. There's no books, no library. He was never made famous. He was a failure by most people's standards because the church fired him because he because he was gone too much traveling and stuff. And so this guy, you know, he's still overseeing ministers and they're coming in and they're being ordained. And so in one of the meetings, this young man walks in and, and he starts um, um, noticing that Father Nash is up front and he's praying and his synopsis of the situation is that it feels like this guy, Father Nash, is backslidden. He's not even really excited about God at all. But he's still going through the motions of ministry. And so, and so, anyways, this, this guy's name, this young man, was named Charles Finney. Now, everybody knows who Charles Finney is, or a lot of people know who Charles Finney is. I found, actually, there's some of the younger generation that does it. But Charles Finney was known... Like for major revivals in our country, amen. Like, like his, you could fill libraries with this guy. He was majorly famous in terms of revival. Hundreds of thousands, a hundred thousand people would come to Jesus in one revival, amen. That's a lot of people. History, actually, the history books record that the anointing of God was so strong on him that when he was riding on a train by New York City that people would fall off their bar stools and repent and give their lives to Jesus Christ. And Charles Finney didn't just go where it was easy. You know, sometimes I'll ask a prophet if they would like to come and minister in a particular area. And they're like, I don't want to go there. It's hard. It's like, yeah, we don't need you where it's easy. That's the reason why we asked you to come in, right? But Charles Finney went, Charles Finney would go into these, into these hard places. He would go up to logger camps where men were not interested in having a relationship with God. They just worked hard all day. They wanted to carouse and chase women and, and drink and just, you know, blow off steam. And God, God would break out in revival in these kinds of places. Amen? And so this is, this is what Charles Finney was known for. But Daniel Nash um, and Charles Finney, they teamed up and they ended up becoming friends. And in that process... Daniel Nash got on fire for God, and he found his calling as an intercessor. And he began to and he began to pray, and he began to go into towns. And sometimes he would take like a twenty-five cents, and he would go in and rent a room or a basement that was mildewy, and he would get down on his knees, and he would just begin to pray for that city and for revival to break out in that city. And then they said sometimes he prayed so hard that blood would actually come out of his nose. I'm not indicating that we should do that necessarily, but I'm just saying that was the intensity in which he prayed with, right? And, and, and one woman, one time she came up to Charles Finney and said, I, I, I rented a room to this guy, but he's down there and he hasn't come out for any food or water. He hasn't, he hasn't, he hasn't uh, um, come out and said anything at all. And, and I don't know if he's okay, but there's weird noises that are coming from the downstairs basement. And I don't know what to do with this guy. And, and Charles Finney said, just let him be. He's just praying. He's travailing in prayer. And so he's praying. But Daniel Nash knew that it was time to invite the revivalist Charles Finney to come in and preach revival when people would spontaneously fall down on the sidewalk and begin to cry out to God. They didn't wait for just the meeting to cause revival to be stirred. He went in and he changed the atmosphere of a place with the atmosphere that was inside of him. And then he would call the revivalists and he'd say, it's time to come. And Charles Finney would come in and he would do the revivals. And Daniel Nash didn't even go into the meetings. He stayed in a different place. He never went up on the platform. Nobody knew who he was. He was in another room, either in the facility that they were meeting in or another house there in town. And he would continue to pray. pray. Now, one of the significant things that I find about this guy named Daniel Nash is that, is that when, he, when he died, they found him on his knees in the posture of prayer. This was a man that was dedicated to connecting with God, right? So he, here's one of the things I, 
Everybody knows who Charles Finney is. He was famous. A mighty man of God. I'm not debating that at all. I think, I think he was an awesome man of God. The stories of his life. But here's what Charles Finney said. He gets up in one of his revivals. Three months after, after Daniel Nash dies. He says, I've got an announcement to make. We're no longer going to be doing revival meetings. Because the power and presence of God is no longer the same in our meetings since Daniel Nash passed away. That was the testimony of the mighty man of God that was seeing all of the healings and all of the salvations and all the signs and wonders and miracles of God. I, I still believe he's a mighty man of God. But the testimony of the mighty man of God is that there's no power and presence of God in our meetings because there's no more Daniel Nash. There's no more Daniel Nashes. There's no one to take his place. My question is this, where are the Daniel Nashes of today? Where are those that don't care about being famous and those that don't care about having to be made known and those that just want such the heart of God that they're willing to pay the price. They're willing to do what needs to be done even if nobody else does it. And they're willing to call heaven down. They're willing to call heaven to be released in a place till the atmosphere changes the lives and the hearts of people. They say that when Charles Finney... Finney preached, he said, I think it was like 88 or 87 percent of the people that gave their lives to Jesus Christ, that they walked that out the rest of their lives. So that means that there was 100,000 people that got saved. At least 87 to 88,000 people lived for Jesus radically the rest of their lives. I think about another guy named Alfred Gar. Um, just previous to the Azusa Street Revival. He has, a, he has a church of a thousand people, which is like considered to be a mega church back in that time, previous to 1920. And, and he's, uh, he's pastor in this church, and uh, I think it was a conservative church, like a Presbyterian or a Methodist church. And he's, one day he goes out for a walk, and he hears some worship, and he hears some prayer that's coming from this factory. And he sticks his head in to see what's going on. And, and, and there's like 12 people in there worshiping. And praying for God. And he gets touched by the Holy Spirit. He ends up getting baptized by the Holy Spirit. So he goes back. And he, and he begins to tell a few of his buddies about it. And they go back with him. He says there's something going on down the street. That's not happening in our church. And so they go back. And his buddies begin to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. After about three and a half weeks. He stands in front of his church. Of a thousand people. And he says, you know what, there's something happening at the church down the street that's not happening in our church. There's 12 people that are meeting down there. And he says, he says, I propose that we shut down our church and we become a part of the church down the street. I mean, who does that? You got a church of a thousand people, you're in the successful you're the successful minister. You got influence. You have a decent salary. You got people coming. And he says, you know, there's something going on down there. And proposes shutting down his church. Now the pastor, the pastor down the street is a guy named William Seymour. He's got this church of 12 people. William Seymour was an African American gentleman that was in Parham, Kansas, that that was not allowed to meet in a room to hear about the message of the baptism of the Holy Spirit because Caucasian people would not allow him to be in the room. It was an injustice. But William Seymour was so hungry for God that he sat in a closet with the door cracked about two inches in order to just hear the message of this, this message about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was an injustice, but this was a man that chose not to get offended, but he wanted more of God and did not want to miss what God would have for him. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't get baptized in the Holy Spirit there, but he goes back to Azusa, California, and he gets baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he starts these meetings, and he has about 12 people that are meeting together, just a real small beginning, and he goes out on the street, and he puts a paper bag over his head, and has one eye cut out, and he preaches the gospel. And he says that the reason why he's wearing the paper bag is because he doesn't want anybody to give him credit for preaching the gospel. He doesn't want to be made known for it. In other words, it's kind of the opposite of Facebook. 
an opposite of TBN sometimes, amen? Now, I'm not saying that I'm against those things or, or using those things, but sometimes people do them for the wrong reasons, right? And that was the opposite. This was a man of humility. So when, so when Alfred Gar gets up in front of the church and begins to say, I believe we're supposed to shut down our church, and we're supposed to become a part of that church down the street, it was because the Holy Spirit is touching him. And it doesn't always come without opposition. Because his wife, his wife came. And she says, hey, if you do this, sweetheart, I'm going to leave you. Now, I know we have all kinds of ideas about how we're supposed to do stuff in terms of priority, but I just have one priority. If God tells you to do it, you ought to do it. I mean, you should know it's God. But if He tells you to do it, you ought to be obedient. Amen? Amen. And so he says to her, I guess he was a rational guy, he says, well, honey, I, I can't stop you. If you want to leave me, you can go. But I like to ask you to just do one thing first. And that's it. You would just come to one meeting and find out for yourself whether this is God or not. So she agrees. So she comes to the meeting. She's sitting in her chair. And the Holy Spirit knocks her out of her chair. And she gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. So much for the Holy Spirit being a gentleman. <laughs> Amen. See, see what I want to suggest to you is this that maybe one of the biggest moves of God that our nation has ever seen and, and is still affecting the world today broke out not because not because a man built his ministry but because he died to it I wonder sometimes, though, if we're building... I'm not, I'm, I'm not suggesting that here, by the way. That's not my point. Amen? Maybe you're in the smaller church, and there's a big church that's supposed to come over and be a part with you. Amen? I, 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 yeah. so what, what I'm suggesting is that sometimes... Sometimes we're, we're doing something, and we want to hold on to that, and God has something big. And what... And what 12 people couldn't do, a 1,000 people could. It was a sign of unity. Do you know there's never been revival without prayer? There's never been revival without unity. There's never been a revival without sacrifice. And here there was this expression that happened because a man was willing to give it up. And actually, a thousand people could now share the gospel in a way that twelve could not. A thousand people could finance revival in a way that could not. And God had something bigger for Alfred Gar. Because what they decided to do, because the denomination rejected him, is that they were going to sit underneath William Seymour's ministry for one year and take no salary. How many know that takes humility? Here, you were the church with a thousand, you have the salary, and now you're going to go sit underneath him for free and learn everything about God, that, that, that had to be God. That took some humility for a leader to do that. So he sits underneath this guy and learns everything that they can about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And at the end of one year, they feel like God is calling them to go to China and to be missionaries to China. And so, and so they take the last of their savings that's left and they buy two flights and they go over to China and, 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 and they have a little bit of money to live maybe for a couple weeks or something. They start doing underground underground um, uh, churches and stuff like that, ministering to these underground churches, and, and God breaks out, they're teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and at the end of the meetings, the leaders come out and they say this. They say, they say, hey, we were told that we should save all of our tithes and offerings, but we have no idea what to do with them. See, they had no, no support from any denomination because they were rejected, and they used those tithes and offerings to support their missionary journey. And it became one of the foundations for causing revival to break out in China. I don't know if you know this, but China's about ready to become the number one Christian nation in the next year and a half in terms of num numerically right now. Amen. See, my point is that Alfred Gar could have felt like he was making a sacrifice of some sort by giving up his influential position in a church. Instead, God was getting ready to promote him. It wasn't just that he was, you know, and there's nothing wrong with just being a pastor or this or that, but God had something bigger that was meant to, meant that he still wanted to do with him. He wanted to expand his thinking, and when he laid down one thing, God was getting ready to move into something that was going to be even bigger. Amen? Sometimes we want to hold on to stuff. I mean, I want to close with this this morning, amen? 
It says here in, in Mark chapter 9, it says this. It says, um, in verse 49, it says, And everyone will be salted with fire. Every single one of us. What does that mean? That God will pour out His relevance and His reality, His fruitfulness upon us by the fire of God, by the presence of God. I mean, even this morning, we've been in worship. Anybody felt the presence of God? Amen. Anybody felt the presence of God here this morning? Amen. That That's what the God said, is He salted you with fire. He's exposed you to his presence. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that actually says, if the salt loses its saltiness, it's no good for anything except for to be thrown out and trampled out of my men. Now that verse used to scare me. Because I used to think, oh man, if I lose my passion, oh my gosh, God's going to throw me out and then I'm going to be stomped on. It just the picture didn't seem appealing to me, right? And, and, and so then I'm like, I'm good for nothing. But you know, there's, there's a part of this verse here that tells you how to get it back. See? It's saying if you lose your passion, you lose your excitement for God and your hunger and your thirst for God and wanting to connect to Him, you become irrelevant. Anybody feel like they've been irrelevant? Anybody, anybody feel like maybe they're not being as fruitful as they want to be? Yeah. Or maybe you just feel like you, you're not being as relevant as you want to be? Anybody feel like maybe there's like a glass ceiling over you? Or maybe you pounded your head up against the same ceiling, feel like you just can't break through to that next level? Well, see, the Bible's telling you in verse 50, in the King James, it actually, uh, 49 and 50 there, it tells you how to get it back. It says there, and it says, and every sacrifice will be salted with salt. Hmm. What's he talking about? And every, he said, every time you sacrifice. Now, the first thing we think about when we think about sacrifice is money. But here's the truth. I would rather give you my give me my money than my time. Honestly. And in the Western world, I think we're that way. So we think, oh, sacrifice. Okay, well, yeah, I'll throw another $10 in. I'll throw another $20 in. I'm sacrifice. I'm all in, right? But that's not what we're talking about. And some people ask me, they say, well, you know, does God really want me to give it all? And I, I've gotten real bold with that. Well, if you're asking that question, for you, it's probably a Yes. Because it means you're probably struggling with that. But see, God's not just interested in your money. He wants it all. He wants, it. He wants your time. Because some of us don't want to sacrifice our time. And God wants us sometimes to sacrifice our time. But more than that, I think that in the church, I think we have a hard time sacrificing because we don't want to get our hearts involved anymore. We've been hurt. We've been disappointed. We've been discouraged. People have said things to us that they shouldn't say. We've felt like we failed. And we just are afraid to get our heart into it again. And one of the things that I've been noticing is that when God has been touching people again, He's breaking their hearts again. Calluses are coming off people's hearts. Calluses are coming off of people's eyes again. And they're beginning. See, like, I, I, I've been there. As a pastor, I remember, like, you know, you, you, there are people sometimes, you know, that they go their own way. You invest in them and things like that over the years. And I, 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 I remember at times going, I'm, I'm never going to invest in anybody ever again. If you've been in leadership or anything like that, sometimes you got to feel like, I, I invested, you know, my heart into people. And sometimes you're kind of like, I'm never doing that again if you get hurt. People reject you. See, God wants it all. He wants to see if God is really who He says that He is in our lives, then we should be made whole. And if we're made whole, that means we're not supposed to be holding on to all that. There's not supposed to be a residue of rejection and a residue of disappointment and a residue of all of this other stuff. There's supposed to be a residue of the presence of God, a residue that causes the glory of God to be seen upon us because we've been with Him and we're not carrying around all of the residue of the past and all of the residue of the things that have, have tried to tear us down and take us down, we're carrying the residue of the Most High God. Amen. And He's making a way because we've chosen to let go of that stuff and to give it all to Him. Amen? Amen. I'm just telling you, here's, this is my heart. I'm hungry for God right now. I want you to be hungry. I want you to want God more than you ever because you're going to miss out if you don't. 
God's giving the opportunity to respond to him. But he is doing something brand new. And maybe you were on fire for God once. Maybe you're on fire for God today. And if you are, awesome. Praise the Lord. Let's run with it. Amen. But maybe, you, maybe you've been on fire before and you're not really on fire today. Don't just keep going through the motions. The Bible tells you how do you get it back. You sacrifice. You quit living for you. The Bible is not a consumerism kind of a gospel. It's not just for us. It is for us. But it was meant to be bigger than that. Amen? And it's not just that we go so we can be blessed. No one else in the world is going to know that they're loved if we're not willing to sacrifice. Like, I mean, I believe in the... I, I, I'm a big grace guy. I'm a big grace guy. I love the grace message. But, you know, I know people that when they teach the grace message, well, you don't have to do anything because, because the grace of God, God already loves you. Jesus is already beaten for you. And you know, all this stuff. I agree with that. At the same time, it's not about whether God will love you. It's about how will anybody else know that God loves them? You have to sacrifice so that other people will know that God loves them. Not just so you go, well, I went to church and I got blessed again. No, you have to be a blessing. Right. You have to bless other people. You have to sacrifice to do that. I mean, imagine if I went home. I know I said I was closing, but I am. <laughs> imagine if I went home and, and, and I had a bunch of money in my pocket and I'm like, this is a stupid example. But, and I said, you know, honey, man, I've been working hard. Um, I've been gone and preaching every night for 18 days. I think I'm going to go out tonight. And I'm just gonna have a, I'm just gonna have fun. I'm just gonna go out and have a big steak dinner, and maybe I'll go see a movie and just kind of chill out tonight or something like that, you know. And, and I look at her and I go, "Man, I sure wish you could go with me." <laughs> well, I don't know if you have any money. I mean, I, for one, I probably wouldn't be married very long, <laughs> and, and rightfully so, probably. Amen. But I'm just using a dumb example. See, my wife knows that I love her because I'm willing to share what I have with her. People know that we love them because we're willing to sacrifice. And the Bible says here, if you sacrifice, he'll salt you with salt. What does that mean? That means that God will put his salt on you instead of you just operating out of your own relevance, your own skill, and your own ability, that God will cause his relevance and his fruitfulness to come upon you. And it won't be something that you have to try to do. It's something that he does on you. Amen? It won't be seen on you. You'll be salty again. Amen? Amen. I hope you got something out of that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you praise. We give you glory. Can we just pray just for a moment? Can we just, just take a moment and just lift up our hands for a moment and just cry out to him for just, just, just one minute? Just one minute. Just begin to tell him. Just tell him with your own mouth. Will you do that? Will you just tell him with your own mouth how much you want him, how much you want what, what he has. I'm just going to pray at the same time. Lord, I pray right now, Lord God, you would show us your glory, Lord God. We pray like Moses prayed, Lord God. Show us your glory, oh God. Lord, we need a revelation of you, oh God. Pray with your own mouth. Pray out loud because that's how you know when you stop. Amen. Lord God, we need your glory, Lord God. We need, Lord God, a revelation of who you are, Lord God. Lord God, unless you speak, Lord God, unless you show yourself to me, Lord God, I've got nothing, Lord God. We got nothing, Lord God. Lord God, we want Fontana to be touched by God, Lord God. We want California to be touched by God again, Lord God. A place, Lord God, where you brought out one of the biggest revivals ever, Lord God. We're asking, Lord God, that you would begin to resurrect, Lord God, that spirit of revival, Lord God. God, that spirit of reformation, Lord God, that it was upon your people, Lord Jesus. Lord God, how will all the other people of this area, Lord God, know who you are, Lord God, unless, Lord God, we have a revelation of your glory, unless you show us your glory. Don't send us from this place, Lord God, not just this building, Lord God, but from this place that we are in life, Lord God. Lord God, do something new in our hearts, God. Cause us to be hungry, Lord God. Cause us to be thirsty for you, O God. There's none like you, Jesus. 
There's none like you, Jesus. Lord God, let us not be a religious people, Lord God, that would just go through the motions, Lord God, because we've been there and we've done it before, Lord God. Just show it up, Lord Jesus, not getting anything out of it. Let us be a people, Lord God, that are a people that want to have an encounter with you, Lord God, that will not let go, Lord God, unless you show yourself to us again, oh God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, touch us afresh. Let your glory, Lord God, come upon us, O oh God. Let your glory be seen on us, O oh God. Give us a new hunger. Give us a new thirst, Lord God, for more of you. We cry out. We cry out to you. Just cry out to him for just a moment. We cry out, O oh God. Tell him how much you love him. Tell him how much you want him. Jesus. Jesus. We want more of you, O oh God. Break our hearts, O oh God, with the things that break your heart, O oh God. Lord God, break up your every callous, Lord God, off of our eyes, O oh God, that we can see, O oh God. Break every callous off of our hearts, O oh God. Lord God, I confess, Lord God, that I've gone through the motions before, Lord God, but I don't want to live a life, Lord God, of the status quo or mediocre, Lord God. I want to live a life of fulfillment, Lord God, a life where you speak, Lord God, a life, Lord God, that releases fruitfulness, Lord God, a life that touches people, Lord God, a life, Lord God, that changes this world, Lord God, not because of me, but because of you, O oh God. Do it in us, O oh God. Breathe on us, Lord. Breathe new life on us, O oh God. Breathe new life on us, O oh God. Now just sit, let's just sit for one minute. Just sit one minute and let God talk to you just for a moment. This will be the awkward part. If you're not used to being quiet. Time to turn on the music for a moment because I want us not to have something that's an experience that's tainted by us trying to have the emotion of something that's bad. But sometimes we just need God to touch us directly. Amen. How many just can feel the presence of God just when they sat in His presence, touching and beginning to minister to Him? He wants to do more. Here's what I found every time I've waited, I found that you know what? God wants to do more. And I wonder why I waited so long to get there. Because even if it wasn't something that he was doing from some manifestation, it was just what he did to me. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads and pray. You can put some music on if you want to at the same time. Sorry, I just, I, I just been trying to do that from that kind of a place of just wanting God to move. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All of our heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment. You may be here this morning and say, you know what, Pastor? I don't know if I'm right with Jesus this morning. I don't know if I know the Jesus that you're talking about. And I don't know that kind of relationship. I know church or I know, you know, what my family believe. But Jesus said, as I was speaking earlier, I am the way, the truth, and no one comes to the Father except through me. <laughs> That word truth meaning that God is another reality. He came to give you a brand new reality. Not to just have you accept the reality that you have. And that His reality has authority over your reality. He came to make you brand new. He wasn't coming to try to figure out if you could be good enough for, him, for, you to, for him to accept you. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die so that the way that you could be made right was by accepting His Son, Jesus Christ. God's not impressed with what you can do for Him. He's impressed that you would accept His Son because He's impressed with His Son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
I mean, that's not just that's not just a couple people. That's all of us. That means me. That means your pastor. That means every leader. We all needed Jesus. None of us were perfect. We all sinned. Only Jesus didn't sin. And he's the only one that can make us right. So maybe you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor, before I leave this morning, I want to make sure that I'm right with Jesus Christ. Maybe I prayed a prayer before, but maybe I'm not right with him today. And I want to make sure that I'm right with Jesus. And I want to dedicate my life to him. And so I want you to pray for me, Pastor. If that's you, I want to ask.